When I was a kid, I used to play the game Monopoly at my grandmother's house with my grandmother in St. Augustine, Florida. And we'd play the same game of Monopoly, like the same round of Monopoly for days. It would go on like seemingly without end. And I'm sure you know the reason that games last so long, Monopoly. Monopoly is an interminably drawn out game that uh, basically only ends when one person has all of the stuff. In this video, we're going to look at a really similar process that took place in the middle of the revolution during the Great Terror, the centralization of political power in the hands of what became really 12 members of the National Convention. We're going to uh, think about uh, not only how this process happened, but also what that means for uh, what the Great Terror was and why it was so significant. Okay, let's get going. this video, you're going to need uh, something to take notes with, and you're going to need three, count them, three uh, primary sources. The Declaration of Revolutionary Government, the Law of Suspects, and the Law of 22 Prairial. Before we get to the main story of the video, however, let's begin by just looking at how to define the Great Terror. So what do we mean when we say the terror? For the most part, what historians mean by the terror, or the Great Terror, as some refer to it, is uh, a historical period during the Revolution. Most define it as the year two of the Revolutionary calendar. We'll get into that in the next video. Or roughly from June 1793 through July 1794. But in fact, the terror was more than just a chronological designation. During this period, the Revolutionary regime took on certain characteristics. The revolution became radical in a few very important ways. First, the revolutionary government began to institutionalize and co-opt the popular violence that had been present in the streets of Paris since the very beginning of the revolution. This meant attacking and killing those people that the Parisian popular revolution had targeted over the course of the previous years, uh, the monarchy, aristocrats, clergy, and those who sympathized with federalists. The terror was the realization, in other words, of the agenda that Georges Danton once expressed, let us be terrible so that we can prevent the people from being terrible. Second, the terror was the era in which the Montagnards had total control of the National Convention. We covered this in our previous video. The terror was the revolutionary era that had arguably the most political uniformity of any in the revolution. Montagnards controlled the convention, municipal governments, and the committees that came to control all of those. Uh, this was an era of one-party rule. Third, the terror was, was an era of the revolution in which democratic politics did not take place, or at least not in the ways that it had in the beginning of the revolution. As you remember, the revolution was born in large part on the premise that more democratic elements needed to be introduced into the politics of France. By 1793, however, another trend had emerged, the centralization of power and the suspension of democracy. Finally, the terror saw the official adoption of a certain cultural style, that of the Jacobins and the sans -culotte. We'll detail this more in the next video, but in brief, this meant the adoption of Jacobin ideas and the implementation of those ideas by means of the state. It also meant that the institutionalization of certain cultural sensibilities, sensibilities that exalted the anti-aristocratic and anti-privileged, and the process of embedding these sensibilities into the lives of French people and the state. We spent the last video discussing how the Montagnard came to control the National Convention. In the next video, we will talk about what Jacobin political culture was and how it got adopted and enforced during the revolution. So for this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the other two elements of the Great Terror, the, institutional, uh, the institutionalization of popular violence and the suspension of democratic governance. Together, these two processes led to the centralization of power in the hands of a very select few. Our story begins in the spring and summer of 1793. At this moment, France was still fractured by civil war. 
and the revolutionary leaders in Paris were beginning to get more and more radical, more and more violent with their measures uh, to deal with these internal enemies. In the summer of 1793, the civil wars were raging throughout France. In the Vendée, royalist counter-revolutionary armies were using guerrilla warfare tactics to harass the revolutionary armies and expand their control over the West. In the North, East, and South, the Federalist revolts had broken out pitting revolutionaries of one stripe against revolutionaries of another. The fighting was fierce and terrible, and it only stoked fears of many revolutionaries that the counter-revolution was everywhere. Enemies of the revolution existed not only outside of France, in the courts of Austria, Prussia, and England, but also in Lyon, in Marseille, in Caen, and Nantes. This fear drove many in revolutionary Paris to push for extreme measures to root out counter-revolution and, in turn, protect the nation from its enemies. We see these extreme measures most vividly in the ways that the revolutionary armies handled the places that had risen up in open revolt against Paris. In October 1793, the counter-revolutionaries in Lyon finally surrendered after a months-long siege. Apparently, municipal leaders had held out hopes that they might be liberated by an invading foreign army from Piedmont, but when the Piedmontese didn't show up and food and ammunition stores ran out, the Lyonnais had no choice but to surrender. To deal with the terms of surrender and take control of the city, the National Convention sent a representative on mission, a man named Georges Couton. Couton was an ardent Montagnard and one of the men who denounced the Girondins in the National Convention and brought about their expulsion. Upon receiving the declaration of surrender from the Lyonnais authorities, Couton received a directive from Paris. Lyon was to be destroyed completely. The Committee of Public Safety ordered that Lyon be burned to the ground to serve as an example for all other rebelling cities that counter-revolution would not be tolerated. According to the directive, Couton was then to erect a monument on top of the remains of the city that read, Lyon fit la guerre à la liberté, Lyon n'est plus. Or Lyon made war on liberty, and now Lyon is no more. Even a radical such as Couton couldn't stomach such a decree. Instead of raising the city, Couton oversaw the destruction of some of the homes of the city's most wealthy and set up tribunals to prosecute those responsible for the rebellion. And for his gracious gestures, Couton was immediately fired from his post as representative on mission and replaced by two other radicals, Collot de Bois and Joseph Fouché. Ebrois and Fouché brought with them units of the Parisian, Parisian Revolutionary Army, basically Jacobin militias formed by members of the Parisian sans culotte. And they set about searching homes, arresting thousands of people suspected of being involved with the revolt. Tribunals made quick trials, and immediately the state guillotine went to work ex executing the Lyonnais. But the two representatives on mission had arrested so many that the guillotine, in fact, became too inefficient, too slow. So on December 4th through the 8th, 1793, hundreds of convicted men were marched by the revolutionary armies outside of the city, told to dig a giant pit and stand in front of it, and then they were subsequently shot with grape shot from cannons. By the end of Herbois and Fouché's time in Lyon, they had managed to execute over 1,800 people. In Toulon, counter-revolutionaries had actually gotten so desperate that they opened up the city's ports to the British Navy. The city's residents hoped that in doing so, they would manage to endure the siege that the revolutionary armies had placed on the city. Yet in the fall of 1793, a young artillery officer from Corsica named Bonaparte managed to get his cannons to high ground and break the city's defenses. Thousands poured onto British ships, hoping to, hoping to sail out of the city to safety. And when the Revolutionary Army entered the city, the representative on mission, Louis Fréron, immediately declared that vengeance would be coming. Fréron didn't even wait for the guillotine to be constructed. He immediately executed some 800 denizens on the spot. Hundreds more followed in the days after when Fréron managed to erect a guillotine in the town center. Yet the worst violence was reserved for the Vendée. Revolutionary troops had little regard for these counter-revolutionaries who not only rebelled against the National Convention, but did so while brandishing the symbols of royalism, the church, and the aristocracy. Cornered in October 1793, the Vendean army tried to retreat to Brittany to link up with British forces. The hasty retreat, however, opened up an opportunity for the Convention's army to pounce. Revolutionary General Vesterman declared to his troops that no quarter would be given to retreating or surrendering forces. 
and the Convention's army proceeded to massacre Vendeans heading for the sea. One soldier of the Convention's army described that the road to Laval is strewn with corpses. Women, priests, monks, children, all have been put to death. An estimated 10,000 people were, were killed during the retreat. And after slaughtering the retreating army, Westermann and his colleague, General Touro, headed south to the Vendean heartland. One, army in the one officer in the convention's army directed his soldiers to direct to flames everything that can be burnt and to bayonet any local whom you meet on the way. In Nantes, Jean-Baptiste Carrier, the representative on mission assigned to the Vendée, was killing so many people that, like in Lyon, the guillotine became ineffective. In a horrible event referred to as the Noyade, Carrier had 1,800 people tied up, placed on a barge that was dragged to the middle of the Loire River. The barges were then sunk, and the tied-up prisoners left to drown. So many people were murdered in this way that the Noyade caused a public health crisis. Bodies constantly started uh, floating up the banks of the river for weeks afterwards, and Carrier had to issue a decree prohibiting fishing because the water had become so polluted. Between the war and the eventual purges that followed, an estimated 250,000 men, women, and children were killed in the Vendée. The level of violent atrocities in this region were simply unmatched in the rest of the revolution. Back in Paris, things were not much better. Starting in the fall of 1793, the Montagnard of the National Convention began to target those enemies that they and the Parisian crowd had been denouncing for months or even years prior. The first notable victim was none other than Queen Marie Antoinette herself. Her husband having been killed months prior, Marie Antoinette had spent the spring and summer of 1793 in a cell in the concierge prison in the center of Paris. In October 1793, she was put on trial in the hall of the former Parlement of Paris, accused of a litany of crimes. In her trial, many of the rumors and accusations that had been leveled against her in the Libelle before the revolution were just brought back up, almost unaltered, unedited. Though she defended herself from the outlandish accusations, she effectively stood no chance in the Revolutionary Tribunal. Declared guilty of crimes against the nation, on the morning of October 16th, she was driven to the guillotine at the Place de la Révolution in Paris, marched up the scaffold. The newspaper, the Moniteur, reported that uh, upon climbing the steps to the guillotine, she'd ac accidentally stepped on the toes of the executioner. Monsieur, she allegedly spoke, I beg your pardon, I did not do it on purpose. And according to the newspaper, these were the last words that she spoke. A few weeks later, it was the Girondin turn. In October 31st, 21 members of the once powerful group, including Brissot and uh, Vergniaud, were escorted to the same scaffolds where they too met their ultimate demise. According to Alphonse de Lamartine, they sang the Marseillaise the entire way to the Place de la Révolution, and when they ascended the platform, the group embraced and shouted, Vive la République. And within 30 minutes, they too were all dead. Such was also the fate of the king's cousin, the Duc d'Orléans. An unexpected supporter of the revolution, the duke changed his title from the Duc d'Orléans early in the revolution to Philippe Égalité, Philip Equality. And he supported many of the measures of the early revolutionaries. Nevertheless, he was a prince of the blood. And after being found and arrested in Marseille, he was hauled back to Paris to stand trial before the Revolutionary Tribunal. On November 6th, he too was led to the guillotine where he died, allegedly, with a wry smile on his face. Two days later, Madame Roland, the wife of the famous Girondin and one-time Minister of the Interior, Jean-Marie Roland, was executed. Left behind in Paris after Jean-Marie fled to Caen during the Federalist revolts, Marie-Jean Philippon, or Madame Roland, was at home with their daughter when she was arrested and dragged before the tribunal. Roland was, had long held a salon in her home where many important Girondin leaders had come and discussed politics and reform. Marie-Jean was held culpable for the sins of the Girondin as a whole. And at the end of her trial, she spoke to the tribunal. You judge me worthy to share the fate of the great men whom you have assassinated. I shall endeavor to carry to the scaffold the courage that they too displayed. Before the guillotine, as she was being tied to the plank, that would hold her in place, she allegedly looked up at the Statue of Liberty that now sta sat atop the pedestal that once was the home to the statue of Louis XV, and declared, O oh, Liberty, what crimes are committed in your name? 
Moments later, she was killed. Even the revolutionary hero and figurehead Jean-Sylvain Bailly did not avoid the guillotine. Bailly, yes, that Bailly, the guy at the center of one of the most iconic images of the revolution, Jacques-Louis David's painting of the tennis court oath, that guy suffered the same fate as the many others who had become personae non gratae in the opinions of the Parisian crowd. Bailly was arrested while visiting a friend outside of Paris. Some revolutionaries wanted to execute him at the Champ de Mars, the place of the massacre that many blamed on Bailly. But instead, he was executed on the banks of the Seine, overlooking the neighborhood that he once called his home. The point of all this killing was simple. The Montagnards were exacting revenge on all those figures who had been seen to be enemies of the revolution. More specifically, they were taking the types of violence the Parisian crowd had once directed toward people like this, like aristocrats, members of the royal family, revolutionary moderates, and federalists, and exacted it on those people themselves. The state had appropriated popular rage. And during the autumn and winter of 1793, the Parisian government executed some 3,000 people. The guillotine became, in that moment, the symbol of the terror. The revolutionary government had begun the process of appropriating the popular violence uh, of the Parisian crowd and exacting it on the traditional enemies of not only the Montagnards, but also the Parisian sans culottes. At the same time, the Montagnards were also consolidating their power, their political control, not only in the National Convention, but in the entire nation. In fact, the process of consolidation had begun well before the summer of 1793. Remember, the National Convention had already created the office of the representative on mission. A deputy sent to cities, towns, and departments throughout France and given dictatorial powers in order to bring these places in line with the convention. In March 1793, the convention also created two of the most important political institutions of the terror, the Revolutionary Tribunal, the court assigned to try cases of crimes against the state, and the Watch Committees, the neighborhood watch programs tasked with finding enemies of the revolution and reporting them to the tribunal. In April, the convention created the Committee of Public Safety. The formation of the committee came in the wake of news of the defection of General Dumouriez, uh, the, con <clears throat> excuse me, the convention wanted a, a group of people to take on the role of managing the war, organizing surveillance, and ensuring national security. And although the committee had no intrinsic power at its inception, it became a vehicle for quick executive action, especially in a national convention that, now without a king, had no formal executive to speak of. And in the fall of 1793 came pieces of legislation that vested the Committee of Public Safety with significant authority. In September, the convention passed the so-called Law of Suspects. You'll read a portion of this in, in, in a bit, but in brief, the law called for the immediate arrest of any person deemed to be a suspect by watch committees throughout the nation. It further defined suspects as anyone who, by their con conduct, associations, comments, or writings, have shown themselves partisans of tyranny or federalism and enemies of liberty. This cast a wide net and effectively allowed the revolutionary government to use the judicial system to prosecute anyone that it chose. A month later, the National Convention formally declared that the government would be revolutionary until peace. This meant that the laws codified in the Constitution, which was only ratified a few months earlier, would be suspended until such time as France was no longer at war. In essence, this law suspended democratic governance in France. While the convention continued to meet, uh, and debate laws and, and things of that nature, the rules and structures set out by the Constitution were no longer followed, and the law no longer protected individual rights or freedoms. Much of the functioning of the government, moreover, was vested in one group, the Committee of Public Safety. Finally, in December 1793, the process of centralization concluded with the famous Law of Fourteen Frimaires, the new law vested the Committee of Public Safety with supreme executive powers. All subordinate authorities were expressly forbidden to gloss or in any way change decrees given by the committee. All departments were assigned national agents nominated by the committee and reporting back only to the Committee of Public Safety. All unofficial bodies, such as insurrectionary communes and uh, local revolutionary armies, were disbanded. All representatives on mission were recalled. France would now be run by the 12 members of the Committee of Public Safety. So the terror ushered in not only the most violent, most radical stage of the revolution, but also the most authoritarian. 
To better understand the significance of these laws, I want you to pause the video and give the three primary sources that I mentioned earlier a quick read. Uh, pay close attention to how these laws brought about the consolidation of power. We'll talk more about all of these laws in class, but I want to stop and focus on the one that I didn't mention a bit ago, the Law of 22 Prairial. This law came late in the terror, in June 1794, but it epitomized both the way that the terror brought about an, institutionali an institutionalization of violence and a centralization of political power. Uh, check out these passages from the law. The penalty, the penalty provided for all offenses under the jurisdiction of the Revolutionary Tribunal is death. The proof necessary to convict enemies of the people comprises every kind of evidence, whether material or moral, oral or written, which can naturally secure the approval of every just and reasonable mind. Every citizen has the right to seize conspirators and counter-revolutionaries and to arraign them before the magistrates. If either material or moral proofs exist, apart from the attested proof, there shall be no further hearing of witnesses. The law provides sworn patriots as counsel for calumniated patriots, but it does not grant them to conspirators. In brief, what did the law of 22 Prairial do? Well, first it made revolutionary tribunals into killing machines. Now there were no verdicts other than innocence or death. All crimes were crimes against the state. Second, it drastically lowered the bar for successful convictions. The court would officially accept any possible evidence, rumors, suggestions, or simply opinions of character. It outsourced arrests to ordinary citizens, suspended the right of the defense to call witnesses, and even denied the accused the right to counsel. In other words, the law suspended the system of justice. Now, there was simply nothing other than the executive and the power that it wielded, both directly and indirectly, on all affairs in France. And managing this new executive were 12 people, all Montagnards, all supporters of this radical trend in the revolution. The first was Bertrand Barrère. Barrère was a lawyer from Gascony, had been involved in the revolutionary politics since the Estates General. It was Barrère who declared that terror ought to be the order of the day in the summer of 1793. Alongside Barrère was Jean-Nicolas Billot Varenne, another lawyer from La Rochelle. A longtime member of the Jacobin Club, he was an ideologue, famous for saying, either the revolution will triumph or we will all die. The third member of the Committee of Public Safety was Lazare Carnot. Carnot was a mathematician, engineer, and scientist whose main purview on the committee became military matters. Fourth was Jean-Marie Collot d'Herbois, the same Collot d'Herbois that had taken over as representative on mission in Lyon and had massacred thousands in the once rebellious city. And surprisingly, alongside him was Georges Couton, the man that he replaced as representative on mission in Lyon. A lawyer who had become paralyzed from the waist down, Couton was responsible for drafting the Law of 22 Prairial, among other pieces of legislation. Sixth came Marie-Jean Oro de Seychelles. Oro de Seychelles was a former nobleman from Paris, actually, um, who had served as the king's representative in the Châtelet court in the old regime. Nevertheless, he became an ardent revolutionary, participating in the storming of the Bastille, even, and eventually contributing to the creation of the Montagnard Constitution of 1793. Robert Lindet was the oldest of the bunch, a one-time bishop of the Constitutional Church. He became the man in charge of managing the food supply in France. Claude Antoine Prieur du Vernois was an army officer and engineer nicknamed Prieur from the Côte d'Or, after the place where he was from. Alongside Carnot, his main task was organizing the French military, managing the war effort. With him was another Prieur, Pierre Louis Prieur, or Prieur from the Marne. Uh, like many of his colleagues, Prieur Louis was a lawyer deeply connected to the establishment of the revolutionary tribunals. And the final three members included André Jean Bon Saint André, a one time ship's captain turned Protestant minister. Saint Andre became the point person for the French Navy. The youngest member of the committee was the already famous Louis Antoine de Saint Just. Saint Just had made his name as a radical ideologue during the debates over the trial of the king. Young, passionate, and deadly, he was nicknamed the Angel of Death for his frequent and vociferous promotions of violence. 
And then finally, there is Maximilien Robespierre, the head of the committee and the one at the center of political affairs. A lawyer from Artois, Robespierre, had been involved in the revolution from the very beginning, deemed the incorruptible. His opinions were consistent. He spoke out against the limiting of citizenship in the first constitution, the rights uh, for citizens to revolt, and the importance of purging France of enemies for the safety and success of the revolution. The average age of the members of the Committee of Public Safety was 34 years old. Saint-Just was only 26. Together, however, they made virtually every major decision for the nation of France from September 1793 until July 1794. They were, as Robert Palmer once described, the Twelve Who Ruled. This was the Great Terror, a time in which democratic politics were suspended in favor of an authoritarian regime dominated by the Twelve Who Ruled. Together, these twelve would usher in the most violent period of the entire revolution. Their actions, and the actions of those who went along with them, would bring about the deaths of tens of thousands of French citizens. But political consolidation and the institutionalization of violence was not all that was important about the terror. In the next video, we're going to take a look at some of the ways that this new regime also changed culture in France. But until then, good job, um, and I'll see you in the next one.